Was popping, was popping, was popping. Welcome to Nikki and Moose. I'm Nikki. That's Moose. What's up, Moose? What up, y'all? And we have so much to talk about today. We got title. We got All Star Weekend. We got LeBron. We got Eddie Murphy and coming to him. In an just, eventful week. It's just. Yeah. Let's just start with the air horns. Like, this is a lot. Moose, how are we feeling about it? Excellent. It's been an eventful week, man. I mean, this is great for business, branding world, for the entire culture. I think it's going to be a, a good week to go through. Let's just get into this intro and start talking. Two kids from Queens, cut from a different cloth. Now joining forces, helping you to elevate your personal brand. Yeah, I'm talking about Nikki and Moose, bringing you a never before seen perspective into the mindset, the mentality, the behaviors, the driving force, but more importantly, the stories behind the people and brands that you know and love the most. So you already know what time it is. It is review of the week. And this one is done by G4M3R Tech 4 Tech R34L. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yo, shout out to you for having a great username. Uh, this one says a new favorite. 30 seconds in, I knew this was going to be one of my favorites. The energy Nikki brings is so magnetic, you gotta love her. Moose is the laid-back personality that shoots straight from the hip. I love the dynamic of this podcast as well as all the practical steps to strive and stay on course. You know what I mean? Let's go. I'm getting better at this. With Praise a straight God. readout too. Let's Look, go. I'm 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 reading out loud every single day. Not really, but you know, you can say that. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> but shout out to everybody who leaves a review. We read them, we see them, we appreciate you. Thank you and shout out to y'all. So, um, Moose, we have we have a lot. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, first, special. Do I have drum rolls? I don't even know if I have drum rolls. Do I have drum rolls? Let's see. Hold on. What's this one? Nope, that wasn't it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. No, uh, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hey. hey. I found it. I found it. Let's go. We have a big announcement. We are on a brand new podcast network. Hey. Moose, what podcast network Let's, are we on? <laughs> tell them the podcast network tell real them the quick. Podcast and network. after I tell them, I want you to tell them why I'm telling them <laughs> and not why you're not telling them. That part is important. Ladies and gentlemen, we are officially a part of the Resonance Podcast Network. Let's go. Major, major. And, and let me just break down who's on this <laughs> and then we'll get to the joke, right? Let me, we got... Uh, Eric Thomas, CJ, Carl, and Jamal all on the S2S podcast. We got Inky Johnson's new podcast. We got Quincy Harris and Fuzzy with FAQ podcast, and there's more to come. This is all on the new podcast network. What is it called again, Moose? <laughs> the Resonance Podcast Network, man. This is major. No, tell this them been... why. Yeah. Okay. Tell them, tell them. So the reason why <laughs> the reason why I got Moose telling you guys what the name of the podcast network is is because I can't say it right. I can never <laughs> say it right. I say it wrong each time. I say resident or res like I just say it wrong all the time. Um, so I'm working on it. I'm practicing it every day, just like how we do review of the week. So, um, hopefully by the second month of being on this podcast network, we, well, not we, me, I'll get it right. You know what I mean? We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> oh, I messed up my own air horn. I messed up my own air horn. Look, there we go. But, um, Okay. So it's going to seem like we are just a Jay-Z podcast after a while. I feel like Seriously. this. Um, Seriously. Shout out to everybody who listened to the last episode and how we broke down 
how he sold half of Ace of Spades, but now he did another thing. He uh, sold a lot of majority of the stake of title to Square, which is very Crazy. interesting to me. So what we have up on the screen, shout out to everybody on YouTube who's watching, all my audio listeners. I'm going to read it to y'all so you don't feel like you are disconnected. So we got a tweet up from Jack, who is the, uh, what is the CEO of Square? CEO Twitter. Yeah, and Twitter. So remember that in our conversation for later. He says, I am grateful for Jay's vision, wisdom, and leadership. I knew title was something special as soon as I experienced it, and I am inspired to work with him. He'll now help lead our entire company, including uh, Seller and the Cash App, and the Cash App? I've never heard of the Cash App, but that's cool. As soon as this deal closes. And you see the picture of Jack and Jay-Z kind of talking. Looks like they have some kind of wine going on, a nice fireplace, and a whole whiteboard, which is a whole vibe. And I don't know if, so for my audio listeners, they're very strategic because in this whiteboard, you see artists and then the rest is blurred out. I liked how they did that. That was very intentional. I see you, people. I see you. Mm -hmm. But, um... Moose, how are we feeling about this? Yeah, this is a... First off, shout out to Jay, man. I mean, you talk about cashing in on back-to-back weeks. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm assuming 300 is his favorite number uh, (laughs) because, you know, my man cashed in uh, 300 million on on back-to-back weeks with both of his deals. So that's incredible. Wait, wait, Uh, wait. 300 mil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the number. One week, two week... So we're at 600 mil in... Half a billion in two weeks. What? <laughs> Yo. Unbelievable. That's not, that's not light. That's not light. Yeah. I- yeah. 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 It's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And I think it, it shows that, you know, it's, it's really interesting because from a business standpoint, there's a lot of people who question title success mm-hmm. just as a, as a business operation and, and its overall function. But I look at what Jack is doing here and you look at, you know, mutualism. You could look at it at mutualism, however you want to say it, but it's like, man, you're getting one of the best, probably the greatest marketers of all time. Yes. And I think Jay-Z, you can, you know, one of, he, he's really proven himself as such. You could put him up there with a lot of the greats. Now you're getting him to help you run and cooperate some of these other you know, establishments or businesses that you have as part of the deal. Right. So it's a very interesting collab slash merge. You know, I don't even know what to call it, but Jay still gets to pocket a good amount of cash as a part of it. And, you know, it, it, it's really genius how that whole thing came around. I think, so here's where I play a little bit a devil's advocate. Just a little bit, right? Yeah. Um. So... I'm kind of confused with this partnership or whatever this is, just because title in the beginning got a lot of like a lot of grief for being an artist first platform. And that's why it never really kind of battled with Apple and Spotify like it should, because it's not putting the people first. Is putting the artists first, which, I mean, they need their praise and their revenue, all that great stuff. So, of course, there has to be a model for that, right? Now, with this new uh, partnership, right, this one is like, the from what I was reading, was that it was going to bring extra ways for artists to have different revenue streams between merch and memberships and all that great stuff. They were thinking about it as far as how we can provide extra tools for the artists. I worry about that. The reason why I worry about that is because is this going to make title bigger for the audience? Is it going to be more appealing to bring more subscriptions 
or, and, and battle with the Apple Music and battle with Spotify and things like that. You know, right now, clearly you could say that it's better than SoundCloud, but can you yeah. say that it's better than Apple? You know, it, it's, it's a bit concerning. Now, from a standpoint that, you know, Jack is pretty much founded Twitter, right? So what can happen the back end is amazing. It could be it could be very amazing. But until they take away that language of the artist first, I'm still going to think that Apple's going to be above that. Now, the the crazy thing I was having a conversation with an individual that um, I will remain nameless because I didn't see if I can bring this up on the podcast. So uh, shout out to this uh, anonymous individual. But uh, he said, how, how do you, how do I say this? How do you claim black owned so much, but continue to give up majority of the stake to non-black people, Mm, right? And I'm like, I can see why you say that. However, from a standpoint of this is going, one, title wasn't necessarily in the big running anyways, so maybe a shift could help First and foremost, two, he may he may be playing the long game because now he he has a seat at Cash App and Seller. I don't know what Seller is, but clearly he has a right. seat on that, right? So I'll give you title, which was kind of in the middle anyways, to get something bigger, to get my hands on a payment thing now we're in that game now i have a voice in that game right so i could see why anonymous said that but then i'm thinking from a standpoint of this is a bigger picture this Mm. is everybody expects music from me but nobody expects uh, expects Payment processing from me. Right. Now I can get really into it to bring something back to the table for us. I can see that happening. What is your thoughts? Yeah, it'd be, I wouldn't be surprised completely if if UCJ make a run into the banking industry. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, I'm just going to make that projection now. It's like you just never know because if you're already in like you said, that payment processing or that payment exchange type of community network, you're not too close from a banking network. Mm-hmm. And if we're talking about minority owners or black owners and, and staying in that realm, one of, the, one of the areas that we know is way behind is the financial services industry. Yeah. It's dominated right, by, by, you know, whatever, called white Americans or whatever you want to say. But I think that would be interesting. We love you, you know, white I people. know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and and quite frankly, no, I haven't yet. But <laughs> but also, I think Jay has never been that person who doesn't do business with somebody mm-hmm. because of their color or their race. Right. Like, and remember, this is not the first time it's happened. It's also happened with the collab with the NFL. Yes. When everyone turned on him because of the whole Kaepernick situation. Right. So it's like, I don't think he's ever allowed race to be a factor for not doing business. So let, but, could, could this be an argument? Oh, go for it. I said, but I think it all comes in full circle, right? Because he was standing with Cap, then made the deal. And then finally, like, Cap was super accepted again and was trying out and everything. And who's to say that that wasn't a Jay-Z move. You know, right. we, we, like I said, we're not going to really know all the stuff that he's done until probably his passing. 
Yeah. But yeah, that's true. I'm, but I didn't mean that's to interrupt true. you. I was just like, yeah. it, I think it's it's still with the motive of minority own kind of vibes. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to think that honestly, from the position that he's sitting at, mm-hmm. it's really not going to be such a a great deal breaker for him, right? It's not going to impact his life drastically where he's still, you know, for him to say, oh, I'm going to forget about my people or not look out of the interest. But I would argue it's, it's, he's really great out of staying out of his emotions. Yeah. It's like, you know, what we say, facts over feelings kind of thing. He's done a phenomenal job of navigating the business world and saying, okay, yep, there is some, there is some history here and, we sh- probably shouldn't, but from a fact standpoint, if the numbers line up, I'm going to cut the deal. So I would argue, like, is it that? Would would you would would wouldn't wouldn't not making a deal be more considered pride and allowing feelings to dominate at the table instead mm-hmm. of leading with facts? Yeah, I th- I I agree with that. And from like, we're going to have to play nice. We're going to have yeah. to play nice and. It's not a bad thing. Like if you can if you can erase color from your deals, I think you can make a like a huge impact, right? I think a lot of people may like concentrate on that a little bit too much, but is it about that or is it about how many lives can be touched? Now, there are certain businesses that are just like minority owned. That's it. We rock with each other. That's it. And kudos to them. I'm cool with that. But I think with a Jay-Z, it has to be bigger. And so you have to play nice. And you probably, at a a Jay-Z level, you think like, for some people, you get too big to only stay to one demographic anyway. Yep. Like at some point, you're going to hit the ceiling of, okay, I'm only rocking with people who are like me. Right. Right. At some point, if, if your brand or business is to grow bigger, you have to be intersectional or like you have to be involved in different communities or different races and not say, oh, I'm not going to cross over because of that. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans, man. And I know that may be like, for some people, that really ticks them off and, and rubs them the wrong way. But I don't know. It, 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 I've always believed that if we continue to go after retaliation, then we don't move forward. It's just like it, you stay in the same hamster wheel. Agreed. Moving but shout on. out. But shout out. to <laughs> Yeah, we can't be a Jay-Z yeah, podcast because yeah. I can still go. But shout out to Jay. You made... Six hundred million dollars, just cause. Smart man. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, smart man. But um, I don't know if you're a big NBA person, but this is not going to be the super topic. So it's um, depending on when you hear this. When we're recording this, it's All Star Weekend, right, in Atlanta. Um, which, on another note, I saw a whole club and it was packed. And no one was wearing a mask. And then y'all wonder why God I don't want to go people. Yeah. to Atlanta. Yeah. Well, let me, I should better say, I, yeah, I pray for their, their health and their protection. I, yeah, that's going to be... Uh, and I, better I, I all think have the vaccination. The states, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, just, I just don't get it. Like, I really, I really see all the clubs packed. And all of them, mm-hmm. like, typical pack, like, all together, like, on each other, almost hugging each other, listening to music. And I'm like, oh, this is, like, pre-COVID. Oh, this, y'all have a regular life in Atlanta. And then, wow. uh, I, I think I told you, the Texas is, like, we're 100% open. We're, we're good. We're no mass, no nothing. But that's not the point. So, that's another conversation. I'm not. I'm still not going outside. All right, I'm not going outside. I don't, I don't care. I'm not. I'm staying here. So yeah, um, past the test phase. Right. So it's All Star Weekend. A whole bunch of people are together, but there's something that caught my attention that I've been talking about, like behind the scenes, real quick. And for those who are on YouTube, you will see this little nice little article. 
my audio people, I will read it to you. So um, Bleacher Report joins back, uh, blockchain frenzy with NFT sales. Nikki, what does that mean? I got you. Hold on. So, <laughs> so what Bleacher Report is doing is they're selling these digital uh, basketball art pieces, right? Um, and it's called NFTs. And for those who don't know what NFTs are, it's non-fungible tokens. I'll get into that. Don't worry about it. But they're doing uh, these basketballs of like Quavo, little baby, two chains and everything. And it's selling for crypto. It's selling for 0.4 uh, Ethereum, which is really around $600, depending on when they buy it, right? The reason why I wanted to bring this up is because it's looking like brands are moving more into the crypto space than before, right? The fact that on a major weekend, um, through the biggest weekend of the NBA, we're talking about NFTs and crypto and digital art, we clearly are seeing a bit of a shift. So um, I, I think I showed Moose, but they're starting to do like digital trading cards with NBA Top Shot, right? Where you get to pay for moments of somebody dunking or doing a steal and, and you get to own that, right? It's really whether it's digital art, whether it's uh, a digital product, um, wearables from like gaming and stuff like that, anything digital, you could put a token on it and people are owning it, right? I'm finding this very fascinating from three standpoints of an investor, of a content creator, and an influencer. Those are the three mindsets I'm looking at it. But I'm seeing that brands are starting to think about this. I'm seeing that um, music is starting to make a, a wave with it. There was this artist that made about $3.6 million off of his music by selling uh, digital products, digital songs, as well as a fi physical vinyl. And if this is going in your head, don't worry, Moose is going to slow this down for you, right? But... I'm saying this because clearly we've heard about crypto and Bitcoin and all that great stuff for a little bit, but not necessarily on a mainstream vibe, like not necessarily brands taking it on and figuring things out and making um, it part of their products and their services. But with such a big weekend and you know, not necessarily staying on what's happening in the blockchain community, but that people who are going to All-Star Weekend could possibly pay for digital art, which they'll get the physical basketball, but they're paying for digital art and they're paying with crypto or they're getting it for the value of what this crypto coin is is something we have to pay attention to. Is something yeah. as far as us as being brands and businesses have to look at and like, how can we incorporate it in our uh, standpoint? Like, what are we doing with it? But most slow it down for them because I know I, I went. Yeah, Choo. yeah, no, 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 no. This is this is a big conversation now, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I'm I'm going to really credit the branders and the marketers out there for. Uh, choosing to make this a big part of the weekend with such a with the NBA being just so gigantic right now there's really no other way to say it they've done a phenomenal job marketing navigating the pandemic uh speaking to the black lives matter movement like they've done so many great things from a marketing and branding standpoint that has brought more positive energy and more eyes and attention to their game that for Bleacher Report, number one, to start paying attention to the NFT space, the crypto space, the shift here that's happening, y'all, is that this whole concept of cryptocurrency and just the virtual world is becoming so normal. Yeah. You've heard th this is a term that's been used a lot. We got to start normalizing X, Y, Z. 
Well, right now, I think the virtual world is starting to become normal to the majority consumer that brands like a Bleacher Report that's becoming an early adapter into this space yeah. is saying, okay, let's merge it. And, and they're known for being, of course, relatively involved into the entire All-Star Weekend, just that entire event. They're involved in that heavily. So they're now starting to implement some of those layers to it to create those moments and be one of the face, the first people to move. Now, here's the thing, and, and everyone needs to make note of this. The early adopters are often the first one to get the fire or like face the most heat if things don't go well, but they're often the people who rise above and are typically ways ahead of the competition because they've moved first. Yep. So I, I love that you bring this up, Nikki, and you've done a phenomenal job really diving into it, studying it, and really bringing it to light for everyone to look at because... We have to stop. You talk about culture. You talk about black owned, all of those things. We as a society also have to stop being the last to move on some of these things. Yeah. Because as I started looking deeper into the industry, NFTs have been around even 2019. Yes, yeah, like and three that years. industry. Yeah, three that years. industry generated almost 200 million in 2019. So it starts to show you like, hey, I don't, you know, I don't know why we're just starting to find out about it now, but this is something that's been in the works and I'm sure it's only been uh, even further enhanced or it picked up more st steam because of the pandemic, COVID and quarantine yeah. and many things from the virtual standpoint becoming more accepted. So, you know, with the rise of Bitcoin uh, just over the last couple of months, that has shot through the roof as well and kind of tickets couple runs so you start to see those two merge together and, and it makes sense yeah and I think um like we we have to see that everything is turning digital like no but everything is turning digital not only mm -hmm. from content and all that great stuff but like our money is digital like yeah. Um, our products and services are going to start being digital. And we have to figure out, like, when we see certain things like that, like, let me let me pull it up again um, for those people on YouTube. Like, what you see on the screen is just two, two basketballs, right, with different images, one that says two chains and one that has, like, uh, black angels and everything like that. And people are buying this digital art, right? The crazy thing about this, what is very interesting about NFTs is that the original person, think about it from, and I'm not going to get too geeked out, but think about it from a standpoint of if you are a regular artist, like you paint, like boom, you paint, draw, whatever it is. Once you sell that, that's it, right? Right. So I'm, I'm looking into it and I'm realizing those people who do the digital art, those people who do digital products and they sell it as an NFT, if the, if the person who buys it puts it out on the marketplace, right? Because there's this whole NFT community right now that like sells and trades all these things. If they sell it, if the person sells it, the original person will forever get royalties, like between, I think, 30, 10 to 30%, depending on what you put in the back end, right? And that's huge and brings a whole different definition of digital ownership, mm -hmm. right? There are people who are literally trying to find, like, video frames now to, to post up these different digital art forms and, and these videos and all that great stuff, like, to have different moments of LeBron uh, dunking on people all throughout the house through a video frame, people are starting to do this, right? Starting to be more common than before. And it brings a whole sense of ownership for to say, yo, I have this moment. I have yeah. this art. No one else, they'll be rare. It's not like how we see digital now as far as like, you could buy it on the site whenever. It's like only 200 or 500 of these were made. And those who have it, don't, it's yours, right? Yeah. It's very interesting. It's yeah, very, a sense of, very interesting. 
Yeah, the sense of exclusivity and, and then also the part that I think is super important to mention here too is that when you talk about the original artist gaining royalties forever, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, it, and, and for those listening, y'all, believe me, I'm just entering this space very new too as well. So I'm not, for me, we're it's like, NFTs, wow. That, we're not NFTs or crypto experts. We're just experts, right. speaking what we right. literally are learning about. Exactly. But, but the thing that stood out to me, Nix, is that traditionally, artists never got royalties. Right. So you, an artist may sell their painting to, you know, let's say a museum or whoever it is, and then years down the line, and there are many stories, and that's why when we highlighted Swiss Beats on, you know, and did an episode on him, we talked about how he is also creating a network that looks out for the artist, mm-hmm. uh, even versus that's a form of that as well. Mm-hmm. But in the traditional realm, once your art is sold from one person to another and you look up and you see one of your paintings going for millions, the original artist rarely ever got money back. Or yep. well, let me better rephrase it, never got money back. Never. So the yep. fact that this is one of the things, one of the benefits to it, so you talk about it from a creative or an influencer standpoint, it's definitely a major shift into you know how you can now respect the artist, appreciate the artist for their work and what they've created. So yeah, that's definitely one of those benefits that I think is extremely cool too. Yeah, and go check out that Swiss Beats uh, episode that we did because he was talking about you know changing the art world of where the, uh, from a physical standpoint that the artists will get royalties, but now it's making a wave digitally. And it, this is kind of interesting, but the fact that it's happening uh, in the NBA with the digital trading cards yeah. and Bleacher Report and everything like that, like I bought a digital training uh, trading card pack uh, two days ago or something like that. Like this is starting to be a normal thing. And it's very interesting. It's ve- and mm-hmm. everybody's talking about it. So if you don't know what we're talking about, just look up NFTs and things like that. We'll probably have um, like one resource to it in our show notes. So go check that out. But yeah, I'm very invested in it. I'm looking into it. I made it very known on my social media. And now we're making it known here that we're probably going to be really into this world. So yeah, check that out. But since we're talking about uh, NBA and everything like that, we have to talk about LeBron. We have to Big talk news. about Space Big Jam news. too. You know what I mean? First Big off, news. huge, huge. These images, once again, shout out to my YouTube viewers. Audio people were explaining it, I promise you. But hmm. r- right w- in the middle, we have the Entertainment Weekly cover with LeBron, with... The Looney Tunes people, Bugs, Lola, which I don't know if you heard, like Lola's getting a lot of slack right now because they uh, unsexied Lola. Have Mm. you heard that? No, no. Yeah, so in the original Space Jam, Lola was looking like a hot bunny, and now they totally took away some, uh, some assets and okay. yeah, yeah, they took away that. <laughs> they pulled the funding back. Yeah, okay. yeah, and, I see what's and happening. so people are like, "What's going on?" But that's we're not about we're not talking about Lola. We're talking about LeBron <laughs> um, taking on this huge sequel, huge, by the way. Um, but it looks amazing based off the 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 um, pictures. My yeah. question to you, mm. my question mm-hmm. to you is, which will almost transition to what we're talking about, but are we expecting this to be better than the first one? Or are we just excited Ah. that it's coming back to life and it's giving a fresher look? I would love to hear your your stance on this. Oh, man. There there are really two sides to this, right? Of course, Space Jam, that movie in itself with just MJ's persona and and his whole thing, obviously it's a big deal. So from one part of it, of course we're excited to see a part two to it. We're excited to see what happens. And I'm sure it's going to be great. 
The side that I'm not looking forward to is the, the whole concept of... Now, let me say this. I would be really interested to know if MJ makes an appearance somewhere in there. Like, there's a passing of the has throne, to. maybe. Has to. Right? If like, he does it, I don't know. that's a problem. Yeah, he has to. Like, I got to know what happens. Yes. Like, I'm, I'm already thinking about that. Now, what I already know is going to happen from a social media world, Twitter world, all of that, it's going to spark up a conversation, an even bigger debate around... Which is better, LeBron or MJ? You yeah. know, like, for me, I kind of wish that LeBron would have just had his own version or his own kind of, you know, thing and not yeah. necessarily have to do a part two of this. But, yeah, I mean, you know, with some of these sequels, you just never know. But I'm really interested to see because I, I, I'm a LeBron fan, Nick, so I got to be honest. I'm a big LeBron fan, so I got to, I got to, I'm, I'm hoping that it, you know, I, I feel like my man's going to really put up. He's, he's going to put on a good show. So, this is what I'll say. I want to know if LeBron can act. Okay. That's going to be important. You know? Mav Carter said he was all right, though. That's what I, I heard. I heard in one of the friend. interviews with Mav. That's, that's, his, that's yeah. his friend. Business partner? Okay. All that's, right. That's all his right. friend. A <laughs> business partner? Eh. Friend. Still a friend. Well, well, hey, remember what we talked about? A good friend wouldn't put you in a place to look bad. Ah, so it's like because he's such that's a good a d- friend. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Let me bring you that's back. Really, Let me bring you back. That's a really good friend. Let me bring you closer to me. That mm. looks like a lot of money. I think True. if you couldn't act, I would hype you up. <laughs> Get you an acting coach. I'm getting if, you an acting if you coach for Space act, Jam too. I would definitely hype you up because just from the looks of those pictures, it looks totally insane. I'm excited yeah. about it, but I'm yeah. really hoping that he can act. But from uh, from an expectation standpoint, I don't necessarily expect it to be better than the first one, um, even though it looks almost. It, Pretty much looks better than the first one. I don't expect it. Um, but I will say that it will be the Space Jam of our generation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it should give the same feeling as the first one. Right? So how we felt about the first one, you know, the Gen Z and everything like that could feel about this one. So I do think that's good. And from... You know, from the standpoint of the Space Jam as a brand, I think that's the point. Like, I think we had to make sure we had another the GOAT status to take over this role and not necessarily just make Jordan do it again. Let's get the GOAT of this generation to do this kind of movie, right, and give that same feeling to... To what we have right now. I I think that's what it would do. And if that is the case, I think the Space Jam brand is very um, strategic instead of just doing the, oh, well, it's a sequel. Like, let's rush that out. Or right. let's say this is going to be better than the first one. All that great stuff. But do we... Have sequels ever been better than the first one? Oh, man. I, you know, honestly, I think with the exception of maybe Bad Boys 2. Okay. And, and okay. you know, I, I think I would put Bad Boys 2 as one of the... Bad Boy 3 now, I, I, they shouldn't have even called that a Bad Boys movie. I don't know what happened I there. I didn't even watch it. Yeah, that... I didn't watch it. That was a fall off. Uh, what other other sequels come to mind? Fast and the Furious. Okay. There's about 234 of them, you know? Yeah, I was like, which one? <laughs> <laughs> they got a history of sequels. That needs to uh, that needs to go that away. Come to an end. That needs yeah, to go away. That is coming. Um, yeah, that needs to go away. I just I don't understand why Fast and Furious is still going on. Um, I think uh rest in peace to Paul Walker. I think when that Fast and Furious happened and they did yep. that little scene of that, both drifting yep, exactly. off away. Perfect time to that close. That was it. done. I was not Perfect. expecting to see another Fast and Furious, and now they're coming out with eight more. 
I'm good. I'm not going to watch it. I'm over it. It's not this generations of Fast and Furious. You're still giving the same kind of vibe. Just let it go. Just yeah, yeah. Just let it yeah, go. I think it's done. I think it's done. Then, then there's the other world of it too with uh, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. I mean, I think those were you know. I never watched not a too single one. Ah, never watched a single one. Couldn't do it. It's, uh, Couldn't it's worth a it. watch. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Wasn't going to do it. But, yeah. <laughs> but talking about sequels, of course, of course, we have to talk about Coming to America 2. Part dose. And 33 years later, what does this mean for the brand, Betty Murphy, all that great stuff? So the funny thing is, I honestly, first off, I'm not very active on my personal Facebook page. I don't like doing it. I'm just too much on my business vibe. Personal, I don't really care. However, I really wanted to get in touch with the people as far as what did they think about coming to America since it was such like a long waited one. Like, of course, you're going to think about what is it better than the first one? Was it worth yeah. the wait? All that great stuff. And I'm just like, after, so for me, I'm going to say this after 30 something years, why? Right. Why? Once again, if it's like what I feel about Space Jam, that is going to be this generation's, you know, Space Jam or this generation's uh, coming to America, then cool. But if we're comparing the the two movies real quick, coming to America was, it, it did something for the culture. Like that is something, it's, a, it's almost, it has its own cult following, right? Yeah. It's, plays every month every holiday it's there Mm. you can find it um it's just a movie that is almost required to watch especially if you're a minority especially if you're from new york but especially if you're from if if you're a minority yes i was was waiting for you to say queens that's that's for moose that's for moose i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna be honest I may be the only minority that didn't really like coming to America, the first one. Dang. I can admit that. I can admit that. Say what you want in the it. comments. I'm cool with that. <laughs> I've heard it all my life. I get it. Now, I'm not talking from a standpoint of just like I didn't like it. I understand what it did for the culture, right? So from a culture standpoint, I understand how important this movie is, how anticipated it is. And I was very interested with people like Tiana Taylor and Rick Ross and bringing up all the old characters, like how it would really be. And so I asked my Facebook people, right? And we actually got like, Mixed reviews, like it was okay, but not worth the wait. I loved it, loved it. Uh, someone said trash, whack. <laughs> uh, loved it so much. I want to throw a, a that Z word party. I can't even say it. Uh, l- no sequel is the original. Not expecting the original every time. It's more than 30 years later. Different times in technology, um, which a lot of people agreed with that. I just want to see the old characters. I could have cared less about the storyline. I loved it, loved it, liked it. So it's just different reviews, right? So, and look, I, like I said, I'm not very active, but this, this, uh, everybody they has something out. to say about it, right? Yeah, everybody has something to say with it. The thing is, yes. Bringing back that old feel for a certain crowd, right? Great. Um, Now, I feel like they pulled a versus. 
What mm. I mean by that is like, I don't expect to um, come close to the first one, but I do want to bring uh, awareness to the brand. And so you could watch the first one understand where this is coming from and why there's so much hype, then see the second one and just enjoy it. Because people did say like they kind of enjoyed it, right? I watched the beginning. I'm not going to sit here and say that I watched the whole thing because I didn't. I watched the beginning. The production is amazing. What they did with that, what I like is they knew they had to up that. And they, they took advantage of where are we at as far as technology, like somebody said? It looks amazing. The production is amazing. The people that they brought in was amazing. Makeup, all that great stuff. Great, right? My thing is, if it's not going to give me the same feeling or beat it, why are you spending that much money and making us wait that long? For a movie. This may not be the most popular answer. I'm just saying that's how I feel. Yeah. Okay. I see where you're coming from. Okay. I see where you're coming from. Okay. I I see it a little bit differently. Okay. Right? I see it a little bit differently. And here's why. Mm-hmm. You and and you see this really a lot more popular with with authors, and I'm sure with probably directors, just writers in general, right? The people behind the scenes that don't normally get the credit. Yeah. There is such a big fear and level of anxiety that many of them have to go through to to get ready to do a part two because Mm -hmm. they know it's never going to meet the expectation of the audience, especially when their first movie or their first uh, part was so successful. Yeah. So number one, the fact that they were all able to come together and many of the, the starring cast also reappeared, so I thought that was awesome. But the fact that they were all able to come together, like you said, some 30 years later, and still step up to the challenge of like, you know what? Pretty much everyone knows. No sequel is better than the original. Yeah. But the fact that, again, that they were able to have the courage to step up to the challenge and say, shoot, let's just do it, I give them credit just off of that. Because okay. there are many people who don't overcome the fear and, like I said, the anxiety of, putting the pen together to the paper to say, all right, let's do the part two. So I thought that was awesome. Now, at the same time, Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but get Black Panther type vibes from it, right? I literally watched it last night and I just felt, yeah, like it was like, and and maybe because Black Panther was so good. Honestly, Black Panther is probably one of my favorite movies of all time just because of the storyline, the meaning, Chadwick, like just everything. I thought it was so significant. Is it of all time? I really think so. It's it's a it's a phenomenal movie. I think so. Oh, now, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm making bold predictions. And that's just, I'm bold. Just, I, just gotta, I don't, I, yeah, I don't I even just, have a sound for. I just I. Yeah. That's bold. It's it's one of the greats. I think it takes its own category. Like when you look at when you look at Black Panther. I don't know that there are other movies in that particular category that Mm -hmm. you can compare to, especially for the minority community. Like, I don't, I can't think of any. So for that, it's like, all right, in that category, it takes its own thing. No. (laughs) What? (laughs) I was going to say, maybe Will Smith's Independence Day. What? That caught me off guard. Golly. Welcome to Nikki and Moose uh, uh, podcast on the Resonance Network, y'all. On the podcast <laughs> network. Yeah, <right. laughs> Sheesh. Uh, so, yeah. So, I, I, I did get some, some like, Black Panther vibes from it. But I can see why, right? And I don't mean to spoil the movie for anyone who haven't watched it yet. Uh, make sure you go check it out if you don't want me to give you some cliff notes about it. But you can see the modern day, like, the, the, the main idea that they're trying to portray is like, yo, life has changed since we've originally created this first movie, right. and we have to now start incorporating some of those changes for today's viewers, right? The fact that we're going to showcase females in a position of power, the fact that we're not going to be hypocrites between uh, 
you know, father and son. And although we may have made some mistakes, we kind of get on our children when they make similar mistakes or the blended family kind. So there's like a few different things from a modern day standpoint. It's like, okay, it's cool to bring that into the, to, to the art and kind of showcase a new storyline. Is it better than the first one? I can't. I think the first one was just too much of a Queens classic. I absolutely loved it, but I still give them credit for at least stepping up to the plate, you know, and uh, and taking a crack at it. So what I will say is that I am, like, as far as coming to America as a totality, right? I love how, like, it's such a cultural movie for, mm -hmm. like. Just for the culture, period, right? Um, and when I was looking into it, I found a clip of Eddie Murphy kind of just really speaking on that. Like, why why is it 30-some years later, we're still watching the first one? And not just, like, here, like, worldwide. Like, why is that really, and what can we really learn by that? So I found a clip real quick, that uh, pretty much talks about it. About our local stories with black folks. Really, movies with black people around the yeah. world go see our movies. You know, the reason they go see coming to America, they are coming to America around the world is because universal themes. So the themes that are in this picture, you know, the love and family and, uh, and tradition and doing the right thing, those are, those are, and female empowerment, those are all, you know, universal themes. So, um, that made me think from a standpoint of maybe this is why some, maybe not even just from the movies, but like a product and, stand, and, and service vibe, they don't necessarily hit global uh, exposure or bigger exposure because they're looking from a smaller point. They're looking from a very local standpoint instead of necessarily what can hit, um, the, what could be the themes that everybody can connect with that is interested in this. Now, I'm not sitting right. here because I completely believe in niching down and everything, Right. But I feel that there's still certain points that you could reach that no matter if you live in the U.S., England, uh, Uganda. Shout out to our Uganda fans. Yeah, you know I mean, we got Uganda people listening and watching and all that great stuff. Shout out to Uganda. <laughs> oh, man. But um, whether you're in all those different countries, they can still connect with that particular thing. Cause I'm like, I'm really fascinated that this is one of the movies that is talked about forever. Like I like a few movies, right? But they don't have that lasting power. Um, like one of my favorites is Scarface. Now though that does last, mm. right? That does last. It doesn't have the impact as coming to America. I don't I don't see that. Why? Because it's kind of violent. Uh, you can't really connect with it if you're not a drug lord. Uh, <laughs> That's things, real. Things like that. It like reminds you, me of the Godfather, too. Right, right, right. If you're not really an immigrant, if you're not, you know, um, in the minority, like, the great thing about coming to America is just it's not so focused on just a kind of a black movie. It's just of culture. It's just of things like, like he said, like women empowerment, love, family, things like that. That's no matter what your skin color is, that's what it is. So I'm looking at it like, yo, how can we really look at our brand and see if we could have certain themes that can reach the world. Like we're going to have specific That's problems goodness. and everything, but yeah. do we have certain themes that no matter what race, color, sexuality, like they see that they could connect with this particular brand or business like that's, and it's crazy that like, I get that from a movie, like, but it has standing power. 
Like, you can't deny it has a cult following. We we preach about having your own tribe. Well, he was saying that there's people still to this day on, on Halloween that dresses up like coming to America people. The quotes are are crazy. People still quote it. I'm like, yo, how do you have that for your own brand? Because that's something we have to learn from. But I, I'd like get, wow, we yeah. are really, we're really into this episode. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it makes sense though. I mean, the concept of having some time, something multifaceted, like it's multi-layered and it can, it can connect with people on so many different levels. You're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons why things go global. You know, it, again, it takes us back to the beginning of this episode when we said Jay-Z's success really is one of the reasons why is because he doesn't put, you know, red tape in the ground and say, nope, I'm not going to cross into another race, another part of the world. At some point, you want to be accepting of multiculture so that you can allow people to connect with it. But also, you're absolutely right because of we get inspiration from film. Yes. We get inspiration from art and creativity. So there is a big part of that that sparks that inspiration for us that even if it's not for us right now, the the concept of when Coming to America 1 first came out, literally people around the world were starting to become obsessed with this concept of America. Yeah. Right? Like I can tell you as an immigrant myself, thinking of my uncle who migrated here first, and then we followed in the mid '90s. Coming to America was like it's like you pretty much just got a ticket to heaven. It's like yo, hey, I'm out of here, right? So it had that same level of of impact. So yeah, I can see a lot of those connections for it. But again, I think overall, the part, the fact that they did it is major. And also, shout out to Eddie Murphy, man. Like we can't we can't just sweep that under the rug. Like I was looking at some of his accomplishments, and He's we like talk 59. about fifty nine. My man, he looks great for his age, but above that, like you think of the body of work, and we're big on giving flowers and yes. re- you know recognizing people for while they're still here. Uh, I think he did a phenomenal job, and also his career major. I think he he's in over fifty movies. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, Jeez. crazy numbers, crazy yeah, numbers for Eddie. That's crazy, but there there's this one. Uh, one clip that I wanted to definitely go over because it's like the pressure of is this going to be as good or better? Mm. Like, what is what does that mean? Even when I think it was about a year ago talking about going into stand up and I think he had a special. Right. But he did the SNL situation and everything like he was doing a comeback and. People were like, yo, do you still have it? And people were asking like, yo, what is what is the pressure? Like, do you feel pressured? What What is the situation? So I, I got a few clips about it. I'm, I, I tend to think constructively when I'm thinking about something creative. I'm doing something creative. I'll think about, I, I want to think, I'm thinking about how f- making it as funny as possible because I want to shut down when I do it, but I don't be going, I don't be thinking like, oh, what's going to happen? What are they going to say? And are they going to put me on a YouTube? Or are they going to... I don't feel any pressure at all. You know, pressure and stuff like that, you feel stuff like that when you're just starting out in the business. Mm-hmm. I've been making movies for 40 years, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just another day at work. Mm. Mm. Moose, start this off real quick. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, I I think uh, I read I read something online recently. It said the 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 more that you can stop caring about people's opinion, the more freedom that you really have. That's like mm-hmm. that's like a dangerous person to look after because you're starting to rip away from that. So I, I love what he's saying here, and and you know, in in many ways, he's like, yo, yes, there is pressure, but that's really for people who are just starting off yeah. in his level in the game, you know, for how much he's done it and how long he's done it for. At this point, it's just a matter of showing up to work. And I love that he simplifies it a little bit, right? Because I think many of us can begin to complicate our next move or what is it that we're actually doing where he's just like, 
It's just showing up to work. It's just another day. And whatever happens thereafter, you know, whatever they say on YouTube or whatever they do here, it's like it is it is what it is. It's water under the bridge. So yeah, Nick's I'm 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 really a big fan of that concept because I that's why I give credit to people who do sequels, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like you know you're going into a battle that you're gonna lose. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not many people win that battle. So I think it's great that he at least takes a stab at it. Yeah, and and I like you said, I love how he was like, that's the feeling, the pressure, feeling like you have to live up to something that's in the beginning of your career. Right. And it, and I look at it because, you know, as we help people, whether it's personally with their brands and business and things like that, you hear it. You hear it a lot. Like, yo, what are people going to say? Right. I dropped this. Then what if it doesn't go like? It's really in the beginning stages where you worry about that. And after a while doing it for so much, there's this kind of confidence that you have. And, it's, and like Moose said, like that freedom that you really are not doing it for what people would have to say. You've already established such a great fan base, following tribe that... You're doing it for them and doing it for your pure creativity and everything else doesn't necessarily matter. Like, that's why he probably did as many movies as he did to get that rep, to get that kind of freedom, you know, to get that kind of feeling of, you know, I, um, I could do what I want. I could take 10 years off and come back. I can um, take 30 years to make this particular movie. It took four years to do the script right. You know, Mm. Um, I have that freedom to spend that much time. I have that much freedom to make sure I could do it in this way, that way, this way. So I look at that and I'm like, are we past the phase of caring what people say are we but then when you think about it from a movie standpoint they're so big on critics what do the critics say right and when we think even people from a comedian standpoint of Kevin Hart you know Kevin's like I don't care what people say I'm going to continue to make the movies right so Moose, what I'll say is, like, what do you feel is that phase, like, how many phases are there or when do you know that you have that confidence or that tribe to be like, I'm not doing it for everybody. I'm doing it to for myself or I'm doing it for these particular people. Yeah. yeah, and 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 you know, Nick's. I think there, there, it's always a, it's a constant battle that's always happening, right? Mm-hmm. I think even in the beginning of your career, the critics never know about you yeah. if you don't give them something to look at or something to write about. Right. So you you have to trust your magic constantly and say, all right, let me put it out, and be okay with facing the music. Now, at some point, you build a reputation where you're like, man, I actually have more to lose than I do to gain, and I think. In some ways, this is why even when Floyd steps into the ring now, he's calling it exhibition. Yeah. Because even if he loses, he doesn't want to ruin his 50 and 0 record. Mm -hmm. And I see what he's doing. It's like, yo, it makes sense. You get an opportunity to still make your money, but you can protect your reputation because you have a lot more to lose than the average fighter. So I don't think it's something that ever goes away. But for those who are in the personal branding space, in the entrepreneurship space, in in any space where you're betting on yourself to really develop or let's say just grow in your particular lane, you have to cut out the noise. It's absolutely mandatory, right? And then will it come up from time to time? At some point, you're going to get there. I'm sure you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but the fact that you can still stay you and and move forward as such i think you come out like you come out the winner at that point cuz it's not so much to convince the critics to like you yeah. i think it's to inspire like you said 
the people of a minority background, the, the immigrants or those who have dreams and ambitions of coming to America and, and living out a lot of those multifaceted connecting, like those are the things that I think are more important than just to say, oh, the critic or I don't know what they call them, rotten tomato people, yeah. whatever, you know, gave me. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's about that. I think it's always there. But at some point, you know, you got to still tap into your core and say, no, it's more important for me to trust the magic because if, if I don't give them something to write about, you know, it, it doesn't work either. I think, so I'm looking at it from a standpoint of, I really want to break down when did they feel that way? Because literally we've gone through quite a few um, celebrities that have that same like, man, I don't care what people say, right? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really care. Um, even though I low key think Kevin Hart does because he reacts to everything, but then that could be a whole marketing scheme. And so I debate on that. Right. But like, I think like you said with, you have so much body of work. Like, what can you say? What can you tell me? Like, right. what can you do that that is going to mess up what I've already done? Like, there's so much that I have that you haven't. And I'm on the standpoint of if you aren't in my lane or haven't done half of the stuff that I've done, like, why are you wasting your breath? Like, what would, why? What What does that even right. do for you? That like, you don't even try to do what I do. You don't even, like, you're giving me opinions and critiques and that's cool. Like, I'm, I'm, I appreciate your opinion. I appreciate your thought process because God blessed you with a mind and a mouth. But at the same time, I don't care. I don't, yeah. I don't understand. But that's for me is because I've done a lot and still yeah. going to do more. Did I always feel that way? I don't know. I don't necessarily remember the times where I didn't. So I can't intelligently say that. Um, but I do understand when people do feel that way because there's not much that they could hold and say, I've done this compared to maybe my, my critics compared to what this person does, regardless if they're in my lane or not, they still have more expertise in what they do. Right. But I'm, I'm very curious to everybody's standpoint of when is that, it's okay to not care or are you always going to care, but just care a little bit less. I'm good with yeah. the less you can yeah, care. I think it, if, if you care to a point that it makes you stop, yeah. it's like, okay, <laughs> I don't know that, that it needed to go that far. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I care for anything that can help me make improvements or adjustments. Like, yeah. you know, because I'm sure somebody out there is like, well, what's the difference when you tell me, listen to your audience or survey your audience versus not caring what they're, or caring about them. It's right. like, no, those are two different things. You don't want to pay attention too much to the naysayers that it pulls you away from your main piece or it makes you, or allows you to lose sight of that magical equation that you bring to the table. But you do want to survey them, especially if you're in a service, your service need or, a service-based industry, let's just say, you want to you wanna meet their needs. So, of course, you're going to ask them, what do they need? What do yeah. they need more help with? What are some other ways you can add value? So you're surveying them for that particular reason, not for the whole overall aura of saying, all right, no, I'm just going to cut it and quit. But I... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I want to add this because I love when you say that. And even to the producers who have made mistakes in the past or have have had some bad things out there. Yeah. Tell them that example of like what what you've always done or what advice you give to people when that exists. Like because for some people it's like, "Oh, well, I guess I should just stop because my name is already, you know, like I got I got bad uh, articles that are out there on the internet about me." And you've given advice on the flip side of it like, 
don't stop. Don't let that sit at the top of Google. Yeah, Why don't yeah, you yeah. add, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I love when you always add that piece because it, it, it's a game changer for many people. So, um, okay, because I was like, where are you going with this? What, what are we talking about? But th- this is the thing. We have uh, like 15 minutes of, of fame, right? So whatever you did bad, right, could only last for a certain amount of time. The more work that you do that overwrites that bad part, we don't care no more. It is not important anymore. We're looking at the, 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 I like to say you're literally flooding the digital streets with just great content, with great products, with great services, whatever you do, right? You're putting out more of the good than the bad, right? You're going to make mistakes in your journey, in your journey of creating a brand, in your journey of creating your own business, you're going to make mistakes. It's what happens is how long do you stay in that mistake? Does that really stop you? Does that really hinder your movement to getting people to forget what you did. There may be a post, if we're talking from my lane, there may be a post that you only got 10 likes off of, right? But if you're putting out content over and over and over again, that 10 turns into 20, then it turns into 30, 40, 50, and no one really remembers about the 10. No one remembers when you had a trash camera. No one remembers when you had that shirt that had the bad quality and maybe the bad shipping and stuff like that because you've turned around the things that was a mistake or the things that didn't hit that well because you have a crazy amount of body of work that is undeniable. But you can't get to that standpoint if you stop and you just bask in that that mistake, bask in that whole, it didn't work vibe, because there's going to be a lot of things that don't necessarily work or work at the time, because you could possibly bring that back once there's momentum and it all of a sudden works, or maybe, you know, something really failed. And that's nothing that anybody remembers because You've created this brand that is in everybody's face now that has impacted more than anybody. So you have to defeat the the negative and the critiques and the bad moves and everything with positive impact of some way, shape or form. And the only way you could do that is continue to make different bodies of work that people just see. But I. I don't know if that was yeah. what you wanted me to talk yeah, about. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I wanted you to say because I'm just saying, like, had the critics made you stop, mm-hmm. then what sits at the top is what they had to say and you couldn't say your own story. So, like, your advice to people like, yo, keep creating a body of work that becomes undeniable. Yeah. That's the best way to shut out or mute the critics if they, you know, haven't, haven't always agreed with what you've done. So, yeah, I like that. But we're realizing what time it is. We're already low for an hour, Moose. Hour, yeah, we're over hour an hour. This See is that. another episode where we could have went another hour or two, and it's crazy. We're in a great feeling. We're in a great role. I just, hey. We're back. Um, to be honest, I didn't know what Eddie Murphy was, so we didn't do the flight assessment because I didn't know what he was. Yeah. All right, and we didn't give too much context of it. We were just really hyped that Coming to America came back. It's finally here. The talk, like, I found out that they finished production before COVID. Like, in December of 2019, they were done. So, which is cool, because I was like, oh, my God, I thought this was supposed to come out. But it takes that long to make that crazy yeah. amount of... That was crazy. But... um that, wow, we talked all about a lot. We talked about a lot. But um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Do all that great stuff. Um, also, go check out 
S2S podcast, the secret to success podcast. Go check out uh, Inky Serendipities. I can say that. Hey, I can't spell there it, but I can say that. Serendipity <laughs> with Inky Johnson, uh, the FAQ podcast, everything that's on the podcast network. Moose, what's the podcast network called? The Resonance. The Resonance Podcast Network. Hey, Let's go. I'm just saying. Um, but that's all we got for you, Moose. Final words. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna click it back on that NFT tip, y'all. Just know that, yep, the first one through the door is gonna get the most fire, but it's those people that are usually leaving their competition in the dust. All right. So Yep, it's a little uncomfortable. Start adapting with the change and start seeing opportunities for either your brand or your business to be early adopters and not always being the last one to the party.